God lie, huh? No, God can't lie. So if he say that all things, how many things? What do they do? They work together. For what? For the good. To who? To them that love God. Do you love God? Then all these things, even the bad things, even the painful things, even the things that make you cry, even the way they betrayed you, stabbed you in the back, left you broken, busted, huh? Even those things, Joseph, gonna work together for your good. Come on, give y'all some praise up in this place. Sometimes you don't even have the words, y'all. Sometimes you gotta give him a oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. neighbor and say he's able look at your other neighbor whatever they going through they came here tonight they need to hear it speak it on them say he's able <laughs> whatever you need <laughs> whatever you're going through <laughs> whatever you fell short with <laughs> whatever pain is in your body come on church tell the world he's able hey Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, when we say that God is, is able, we're talking about his ability. <laughs> what he is able to do. Mm. And we know God's ability because we read of his record. And as we read his record, we figure out and we learn, we deduce that there is nothing too hard for our God, that he can do anything but fail. The only thing impossible for him is that he would lie, which taps into his promises. He's got promises for you that can't be broken. All he needs from you is for you to know that he is able. <laughs> That's all he wants to know. Jesus told, hallelujah, man, he said, do you believe I am able to do this? <laughs> you just got to believe that he is able. Whatever problem you have tonight, whatever situation you find confronts you, amen. It is nothing compared to our God. Whether it be monetary, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I've seen him move in times past, y'all. <laughs> I've seen him move, hallelujah, not a thousand dollars, not two thousand dollars. I've, I've seen him move twenty thousand. I've seen him move thirty thousand. I've, I've seen him move three hundred thousand. I've, 
Oh, you don't understand what I've seen. And I, you worried about something, hallelujah, that God could move in a minute if you would just tap into his ability tonight. That's what we mean when he says he is able. And the sickness that's in your body, what does his record say about that? Huh? His record shows me Lazarus dead in the grave four days. You ain't got a sickness like that. <laughs> you ain't got a sickness like that. His, uh, his ability, his ability called that which was dead alive. So it's nothing that any failing part of your body has on resurrection power. Whatever it is. If it's your relationships around you that you want to be repaired, what does his record say? His record says when he had a fallen humanity <laughs> that was at war with him, his ability came down from heaven to earth, died on the cross and made peace with a sinful man that had no way. And he can't make peace in your relationship. And he can't settle the problem that you and your wife got, you and your children got. He... God is able to do <laughs> just what he promised and just what he says he can. And I want to tell you, hallelujah, and the Robinsons are here, Kip and Renata are here. And I, I, got, a, <laughs> I got a word for you, Renata. He is going to fulfill every promise he has made to you, woman of God. Every promise. Every promise. There will be a time, Charlotte, where there will be no machine hookups. No machine hookups. <laughs> you're going to go to bed and you're going to wake up connected to only God. Hey! 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 Why? Why? Because he is able, Kim. He is able. He is able. He is able. And you're going to testify in front of this house. <laughs> in front of this house. In front of this house. Because he is able, amen. And, and this word that we have today is all about the ability of our God. This word we have today is all about hope and having hope because we live in a hopeless world. It's hopeless because it's got so many problems, so many sicknesses, so many diseases, so many wars and rumors of wars, so many broken relationships. And man can't find inside of himself any way to solve all of these problems. But our hope tonight had found a resting place. Ha, ha, an anchor for our souls. Our hope is not in us. Our hope is in him. And as long as we got hope in him, there's no sickness. No problem, no poverty, no bill, no foreclosure, no repossession. Hey! hey! No relationship problem that we got to worry about. And it's all about those few words that we mentioned while we was worshiping. Because he is a... Come on, give y'all some praise. Amen. Come on, give him some praise. Hallelujah. 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 Y'all bless me today. Y'all bless me today. Y'all bless me today. Hallelujah. He is able. Amen. He is able. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad y'all here tonight. Amen. As we get back into this word. Amen. And, and not only you that's here in the in the audience, but all those that's live streaming from far places, amen, and we praise God for y'all, and praise God for you tuning in, and praise God for your support, amen, and so we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, amen, and 
If we had to put a title on tonight's message, it's going to be called a, An Expectation of Life. Amen. An Expectation of Life. Hallelujah. That's what we're going to call it tonight. And uh, because the world everywhere around is expecting death and failure. But we got a different expectation. <laughs> we got a different hope. And as long as you live, as long as you, hallelujah, you're plugged into God, hallelujah, you always remind yourself that when you wake up every day, amen, you got a hope that today is going to be better, amen. His mercies are new every morning, amen. And so we have a hope, y'all, we have a hope. And so let's look at 1 Peter 1, 1, we'll read, amen, and I don't have any announcements. We have our Bible studies all over the place going on, and that's going to be going on in Dallas and Atlanta, amen. And hallelujah, be looking out for tabernacles as far as our dates are concerned as we get more specific, amen, for the month of uh, October, beginning of October. So be looking at that. First Lady, do we have anything else? All right, well, for the moving night this Friday, y'all, hallelujah, <laughs> glory to God. They'll be giving away some, some prizes, uh, some cash cards. And so come on through, have a good time with the people of God. And watch some movies and might even win some money. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Win some cash cards. And so that's going to be a blessing. And the moving night is this Friday. Amen. Uh, in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. And so let's look at 1 Peter 1.1. I'm going to set my little time. And the Bible says that, the Bible says, Peter, uh, uh, an apostle, of Jesus Christ, it says. Hallelujah. Let me get this right. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, uh, Bithynia, Bith Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray a blessing on the reading, the hearing, and the exposition of it. We pray that you would bring life in this place tonight. That you would shake off everything that's dead in our lives. That you would trade in, Father God, the grave clothes in this place for garments of praise, O oh King. That you'd give us beauty for ashes in this place, God. Every place that we thought, Lord God, was hopeless and unfruitful and that we wouldn't go in anywhere in it. That you would show us your resurrection power. That you're still the God of Lazarus. You're still the God of Calvary's Hill. That, Lord, though something was dead, if you spoke it, it could be alive in one word, God. And so, Father, build up our faith, build up our hope. Allow us to leave here faith-filled, Father God, not faithless. And so we pray, as the disciples pray, Lord, increase our faith. Because we know when we believe you that nothing will be impossible for those who believe but we also understand that a double-minded man or woman is unstable in all their ways. And when we pray, not knowing who you are and the power that you will, we should not think that we should receive anything from you. Because without faith and hope, it is impossible to please you. So bless us tonight. Fill us with that faith, God, that can move mountains, split seas, and do mighty exploits for your name. We, your people, in the last days needed so badly as the world is crumbling around us. Give it to us now. Bind the enemy out, loose your spirit in, save somebody. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Well, saints of God, we've been in 1 Peter just talking about this letter to Babylon, amen. And we looked at it and we talked about a few points in the beginning of it. We talked about the setting. We talked about the sender. We talked about the credentials. 
and the contents. Amen. And um, worship team, awesome job. Awesome job. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Uh, and so we talked about also the recipients of the letter, like who Peter was sending the letter to. We talked about how Peter described the, re the recipients as strangers, scattered, elect, sprinkled with the blood of Jesus and sanctified by the Holy Ghost. And what Peter was talking about is, is that the recipients of this letter, hallelujah, were the Messianic Hebrews, the Hebrews that were scattered and strangers everywhere, the ones who was in diaspora around the world, hidden in the Gentile nations. That was the recipients of the letter. But not just the Hebrews, the ones who was elect and sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So it wasn't just the Hebrews he was writing to. He was writing to the saved Hebrews, the Messianic Hebrews. The Hebrews who had actually received the Savior sent from the Most High God of Moses, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was writing to us. We know that, hallelujah, because of Romans chapter 11, that is not only us he was writing to because the Gentiles have an opportunity to be engrafted into this grand and glorious root and fig tree of Israel through the blood of Jesus. And so this letter written to us, them by adoption, by engraftment, the letter applies to them as well. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. And so he's writing to believers everywhere. And so Peter, amen, after he goes over the salutation in verses 1 and 2 of this letter, he's about to get to the body of the letter in verse 3. He's actually going to start talking about, amen, what he want to say in this letter. And so verse 3, we're going to get to the body of the letter. And here it is. Let's read it. Hallelujah. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sound boot, I'm going to be flipping between NLT and King James. And so let's go to the NLT right quick. The, the King James, you saw it, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the NLT, great parallel version, great explanation of the King James, Peter is saying, all praise to God. That's when he said, when he said, blessed to God, blessed be God, he said, all praise to God. Peter starting off this letter like with a hallelujah. All praise, the highest praise. To the highest. All praise to God. Who's God? The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Go back to the King James. Let's look at it again. We're going to flip back to it. Hallelujah. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again. All right? So let's go back to the NLT. Huh? He says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy. The King James say abundant mercy. He says, it is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Amen. Remember, it's only the mercy of God that saved you from your sin and saved you from yourself and saved you from the world. Pastor was mercy. God didn't give you what you were supposed to get for the way that you was acting. So that's what Peter's saying. He say, all praise to God. The Father of Jesus Christ, it is by his great mercy. That's what David would always talk about, his mercy endured forever. You know, it's by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because if God wouldn't have been merciful for us, we'd still be dead in our sins. So Peter said, it's by his great mercy that we even are born again. All right? Go back to the King James. He says, hallelujah, according to his abundant mercy... He had begotten us again, we were born again, watch this, unto a lively hope. We're just not born again just to be born again. We're born again to something. <laughs> we're born again to something. And one of the things he give us after we're born again, he we're born again to something. The King James says he gives us a lively hope. Other translations say he gives us a living hope. The NLT says, if we can go back to it, he says, now we live with great expectation. <coughs> great expectation. Because that's what hope is. Hope is 
expectation. That's why we say the world is hopeless. Because they don't have no expectation of anything good to come. That's why they own the drugs. That's why they, that's why they own the drink. That's why they committing suicide. That's why they running up and shooting each other. Because they waking up and they don't have an expectation of anything that's good to come. That is the beauty of being born again tonight. <laughs> we know that weeping may endure for a night, but joy come in the morning light. We know that God is able to turn our situation around in one hour. On. We could go like Israel in famine conditions, no rain, no food, to the next hour or the next day living in abundance like the old days in the Old Testament. Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. Because with God, you could go from homeless, you understand what I'm saying, to having a home that everybody wished they had. Woo. You go from the hospital sick on your deadbed to being the pillar of health in your community. Anybody hear me up in here? Hallelujah. Because he is able, and that's the hope that we have. That's the hope that we have. We got some in here that's been sick on their deadbed, y'all. You see? And after God put his hand on you and touched your body, woo, you're stronger, you're faster, you're younger than you was when you was 30, when you was 20, when you was, woo, because he's able. And that's the living hope. It's a, it's a great expectation that God puts upon us. And, and I'm going to have two points tonight. I'm not going to keep you long, but we're going to talk about two points. We're going to talk about one the way it was, all right? Because we always didn't have an expectation of life, an expectation of success, an expectation of good. We're going to talk about the way it was. And then secondly, we're going to conclude and talk about the way it is. Anybody hear me up in here? And the way it is is only in Christ Jesus. Because if you're not in Christ Jesus, I'm talking about really saved, really born again, really blood bought, really got your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Listen, that great expectation, that hope is not in you unless you be in Christ Jesus. Come on, give y'all some praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Ain't nothing like the power of God in your life to deal with any kind of depression or despair, all right, all right? And that's the power of God, and that is the way it is. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here, amen? <laughs> Hallelujah, so let's look at the way it was, the way it was, talking about an expectation of life, the way it was. Before Christ and before his resurrection, before we were able to be born again, the world did not have an expectation of life. They only expected death. Yeah. We have King David, amen, in 2 Kings 2.2. He put it so eloquently. He told everybody that was around him on his deathbed, he said, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou therefore strong and show thyself a man. He's talking to his son. Talking to Solomon, all right? And David was saying that he's going the way of all the earth. And that's a beautiful statement because it's true. All the earth has to pass the way that David's going right now. It's a road. It's a bottleneck that all roads got to come to this place. Every single one of us got to cross this river. And he said, I'm going the way of all the earth. And David borrows this statement actually from Joshua, the successor of Moses. 
In Joshua chapter 23, I believe it's verse 14, Joshua tells the people, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And no matter how strong you are, how wise you are, how smart you are, how anointed you are, how God-filled you are, you're going to have to cross this bridge one day. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? And every great parent knows how to prepare their children and prepare their loved ones. Amen. And to show them the mortality that we have to deal with. All right? And when you raise your children, like David talking to Solomon, like Joshua talking as though it were to, hallelujah, the people of Israel, you can't expect nobody to live forever. Anybody hear me up on here? Not on this side and not without Christ. I'm going to get to it here in a second. The way of all the earth. In essence, what they saying was, was that I'm dying. And dying is the way that all the earth must go. Everything on the earth must go that way. Everything on the earth must die in the physical. Before Christ, all the earth expected and experienced was death. Huh? Hallelujah. Well, when does this expectation of death begin? It began in the garden. It began in the garden. It began in the beginning, in the garden. If we look at Genesis, Genesis 2 and 16, the Bible says, and the Lord commanded, he, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to dress it, to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. What does it say? For in that day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's when things change in the earth. Because before that, things didn't die in the earth. Are you hearing me up in here? Before that, things didn't die in the earth. Death didn't even exist before sin. Death didn't even exist. We have here in Genesis 3, 17, as we go through the punishments, after they eat of the tree, we know the story, Satan them, tricked them. How does he punish Adam and Eve? He tells Adam, look, a few things. He says unto Adam, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying thou shalt not eat of, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Do we have another verse, verse 18? Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19, and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For thus thou art, and unto thus thou shalt return. Ooh, that's when the expectation of death happened. You see, before this, Adam was immortal. Adam would have lived forever. His body was built to live forever. That's why even, <clears throat> even after the curse, you could find them living 800, 900 years. Because that body was built to live forever. The curse was, was when, when they did wrong, God said, the punishment was, you're going to die. All right? All right? We know that Adam couldn't die before that because the punishment was that he was going to die. <laughs> Are you catching the logic in that? Nobody would punish you with what you're going to do already. Did you catch that, minister? If, if, if Omar got to go to bed at a certain time already and, and he do something wrong, he got to go to bed, let's say, I don't know, let's say it's summertime, 1030. And, 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 we, say, and we say, Omar, he, he do something wrong. Omar, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to punish you. You're going to bed for 1030. He's going to look at me. That ain't no punishment. I was going to bed at 1030 anyway. When he told Adam, you're going to die, it was a punishment. Because Adam wasn't dying. He was built to live how long? Forever. You see? You see? But when sin entered the world, so did death into the world. And the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that from 
Adam, death reigned upon the earth. And it just didn't reign in us, but it reigned in everything, all creation on earth. In Romans chapter 8, hallelujah, I'll, I'll look at, like, now go to Romans chapter 8, verse 20. It says, for the creature was made subject to vanity. Look at that in the NLT. Against his will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. Because Adam sinned, Kim. Now the dogs died, the horses died, uh, the watermelon died, trees died. They wouldn't die before. All creation was subjected to vanity, subjected to the curse, because the head, the crown of creation, was cursed. If the head is cursed, then the body is cursed too. <laughs> Adam was the head of creation. Everything was subject to him. What you saying, Pastor? God had given him dominion. So when sin reigned over Adam, then sin and death reigned over everything Adam reigned over. All the earth, all the creatures. And even all of Adam's seed that would follow him. Yes. Sin and death reigned. And so from that moment on, that fall, there was not an expectation of life in the earth. There was only an expectation of death. In Genesis 3:17, curse be the ground for thy sake, Adam. You know? I could see the earth, y'all. The earth like what I did. The earth like, what did I do? Huh? Isn't that so? What I did. All right? All right? The Bible says that death reigned. Now, watch this. It ruled over all creation. Every living thing is subject to death. The Bible calls it the bondage of corruption because everything is born and heading in that direction. Everything that's born is heading in that direction. Everything is born new, but over time, perishes, yes. decays, yes. corrodes. Yes. No matter how beautiful it begins, yes. everything fades. Yes. Anybody hear me up in here? Yes. The grass withers, the flowers fade. There's only one thing over here that abides forever, but the word of our God abides and endures forever. <laughs> all right? Oh, yeah, but all that, all that beautiful hair, that ain't going to, uh-uh. All the muscles, uh-uh. No, 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 no. No matter how strong, because of the bondage of corruption, we all get weaker. No matter how fast, we all get slower. Anybody hear me up in here? All material things fade away. Yeah, you got a 2023? Yeah. But in 10 years, it's going to be what? A 2023. Clothes, houses, boats, airplanes, trains, no matter what you have, everything is subject to corruption. All living things, mamas, daddies, sisters, brothers, friends, even pets and animals. Like David said, the way it was was this. We all go. The whole earth, we all go, all the earth going that way. Come on, give God some glory for that. Amen? Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're just breaking it down. We're just breaking it down. That's the way it was. We can all expect just death. And it's not just physical death, because that's what I'm describing. But we all could, before Christ, also expect eternal death. Eternal death. What we just talked about was physical death, meaning we all got to gotta die physically. But back then, everybody was going to experience eternal death. Pastor, what's eternal death? The best way I could describe it is, is life without God for eternity. All right? And they got different names for places that, that, that describe that. You can call it Sheu. You could call it Hades. But we know it as what? What do we know it as? Hell. Hell. That's what we know it as. Expectation of physical death, 
an expectation of eternal death. But not only that, an expectation, and this is, to me, is not the worst, no, but this is equally as bad. The earth had an expectation of what I call daily death. Daily death. All right? Pastor, what's daily death? Well, death means failure. It means defeat. It means the absence of life and the absence of growth. It means the lack of progress. Death, at its essence, is the absence of hope. So as people before Christ, we was living with an expectation of physical death, eternal death. But guess what? We was living with an expectation of daily death. The Bible describes in Ephesians people without God. It says you are without God and without hope hope in the world, meaning you woke up in the situation you was in and you didn't think that it was going to get any better. That's the way it was. That's the way it it was. And can I tell y'all that Jesus changed all of that? Can I tell you he changed all of that? He, he, he gave us an opportunity to undo all of that, to undo all of that. And not just, not just undo it, huh, but to excel and be blessed with abundance in it. But do, do you know that the choice is yours? Because even though Christ came and allowed us to have the opportunity to have a living hope. He only provided the opportunity. It's our decision to accept it. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? So I'm sad to say that there are some people still in the earth, probably the majority of the earth, and maybe even some people in this room, who still living with an expectation of death. They still going through daily death. They're going to meet physical death one day, and then they're going to spend eternity in eternal death. But you don't have to do that. And that's not what your pastor won't want for you tonight. Come on, give y'all some praise. Amen? Hallelujah. So that's the way it was. Let's talk about the way it is. Let's talk about the way it is. Huh? Huh? And the way it is comes from our verse that we're looking at, Deacon Carl. He says in the NLT version, he says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Why? It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. We've been saved from eternal death, saved from physical death, saved from daily death. That's why Peter said all praise to God. He says, why? He says, because God raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, now we live with great expectation. We live with a living hope. We live, hallelujah. It's a whole different situation, y'all. You see, you take a saved person and an unsaved person, and the way that they look at life is completely different, y'all. You visit them in the hospital, and the way they be on their sick bed is two different people, y'all. You look at them when they broke, and when they broke and busted with no money coming in and the bills over their head, it's going to be two different people, y'all. You look at them going through betrayal and divorce, amen, and the child of God and the Lord, per- it's going to be two different people, y'all. You understand what I'm saying? You look at the child of God going through pain, huh, in their body, you, and you look at the other one going through, it's going to be two different people, y'all. Hallelujah, because if the child of God do it right, we're not going to be hopeless. We're going to be hopeful that our God is going to make a way. Come on, somebody. And sometimes Christians can get in a bit of a cloudy, dysfunctional uh, feeling where we, where we slip back into a world's uh, opinion about things. But that's why we come to the house of God. That's what David said. He said, I almost slipped till I came to the house of the Lord. Anybody hear me up in here? That's what church is for. That's what the Bible is for. So when, you, when your feet get a little, 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 when you lose your foot, hallelujah, you can be brought back to that living hope that, that's living on the inside of you. All right? 
That's the way it is. We have an expectation, a great expectation of life, right? You see, through Christ, the cycle of death that humanity was in was broken. That's what we mean. When Adam sinned, death reigned. But through Christ, through Christ, through Jesus, the grip, the chain, the siphoning of death to hell, it was, it was intercepted. It was broken, y'all. All right? All right? So, so how did Christ do it? All right? Number one, he was not born in Adam's sinful lineage. All right? He wasn't born a sinner. Okay? Uh, 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 uh. When Adam sinned, it means that this, this disease of sin was passed down to every man and woman that was born with an earthly father. All right? Like an like a old sickness. Anybody got sickness running through their family that the blood done delivered you from? Come on now. All right? All right? All right? The way sickness is, amen, it passed down the line. And that's the way sin is. And every man, woman, and child born from Adam was born sinners. That's what we call original sin. But Jesus broke the line of original sin. Because his father wasn't Joseph. His father wasn't a son of Adam. His father was the most high God. Anybody hear me up in here? That's why our New Testament, particularly the synoptic gospel of John, it calls him the son of the living God. All right? He is the only begotten of the Father. And since his Father was holy and without sin, guess what? The Son is holy and without sin. And without sin, like Father, like Son. Anybody hear me up in here? So, so sin had no dominion over him. The second thing he did to break the bondage, the cycle of sin. So he was born holy, all right? But he also lived a sinless life. Christ did not sin while he was on earth, all right? And that seemed hard to us, but that's hard to us because of your daddy and your granddaddy and your great-great-granddaddy and how sin reigned from Adam. So what looked impossible to us was possible to him because he ain't came from where you came from. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? He ain't came from where you came from. You was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. He wasn't born in sin. When the angels describe him, they say that holy thing that's in you, Mary, shall be called the son of the most high God. And so he broke the cycle of sin and death because he was not born in sin. He did not commit any personal sin. Huh? So what does that mean? Watch this, deaconess. Sin and death could not hold him. Hallelujah. It couldn't hold him. Right. It had no dominion over him. All right? So when he went to die, death couldn't keep him in the grave. <laughs> it couldn't keep him in the grave because death only has power over sinners. Death only have power over sinners. He was not a sinner. He wasn't born in sin. He didn't commit no sin. So when he died, he was telling them, boss, in three days. <laughs> he said, in three days, I'm going to rise again. You see, Jesus knew, hallelujah, what was really going on in the garden. He knew the power and the connection between sin and death. And he knew that death could not hold him. He said, I got, he said, he said, he said, no man take it my life away from me. He said, I lay it down. Anybody hear me up in here? And he said, if I lay it down, I got the power to raise it back up again. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He shook off death like you shake off a nap. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? Like he just woke up from a nap. <sighs> Because death could not hold him down. You see what I'm saying? Because there was no sin in him. All right? That's one thing he did. His sinlessness afforded him resurrection power. But the second thing he did was, when he died, he died 
as a sacrifice for all of our sins. Well, I got to show you. I got to show you the, the, the double blessing that happened at the cross. Mm. Since he was sinless, death did not have power over him, so he rose. Amen. All right? But he beat not only death, he beat sin too. <laughs> Because he died as a sacrifice for all of our sins. And if anybody put their faith in him, all right, believing in him, all right, the sin, both practical and positional, original and personal, any kind of sin you could think of that was on you is now washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. So he conquered death, hallelujah, by rising because he had no sin. He conquered sin in the world by being the propitiation, the atonement, the sin sponge, the sin eater, the sin washer. He knocked the devil out, I'm talking about with a, with a left and a right like no other. Because not only I'm going to embarrass you by I'm rising from the grave, but every single person that put their hope in me, they trust in me, they faith in me, my blood is going to wash away all their sins. <laughs> and when I wash away their sins, guess what? The same death that couldn't hold me can't hold them. <laughs> hey! <laughs> only beat sin and death in himself he beat it in all of us so now death cannot hold me down <laughs> it can't hold you down <laughs> oh my god the wisdom and the knowledge of our God you know what I'm saying the devil tried to beat God that is a God that God created the game you can't beat the one that created the game and so that's what Jesus did. We saw the way it was that that reigned from Adam and Jesus came and he did that in himself and for us. And he flipped the script, flipped the script. It was a whole paradigm shift, the whole adjustment that the world would have to make that death no more reigns. And there's something called a, a resurrection. And from this moment, y'all, from that resurrection, and that's what Peter was saying, all praises to our God, all praises to him. His great mercy that allowed us to be born again. And because he raised Christ from the dead, it was all in that resurrection. <laughs> now we have, hallelujah, we live with a great expectation, all right? Sure, sure. We may experience physical death one day, amen? But how many people know that when we experience physical death, huh, huh, that death is not the end? Right. See, because when I shed one body, I got a new body waiting for me. Anybody hear me up in here? I got a new tabernacle waiting for me. Hallelujah. And that's because of Christ. I get that body that Adam had in the garden. My corruption, hallelujah, put on incorruption. My mortality put on immortality. We go back to the original way that God wanted us before the fall, before the Satan, before the serpent, before. You understand what I'm saying? And God's going to redo this thing, man. Redo this thing. Hallelujah. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, well, look what he says. He says, and we're going to do it in the NLT. He says, but let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. All right, anybody want to know a secret of God? Yes, sir. He says, we will not all die, but we will be transformed. Mm. Mm. How many people ready to be transformed? Anybody, my old body hurting me now. My old leg hurting me now. Anybody hear me up in here? Lord. Yeah, yeah. That law of bondage of corruption won't be there no more. That, that born new and, and just dying every day, that won't be there no more. 
Finally, we're going to have a body that can keep up with the new born again soul that we have on the inside. Because the way we are now, our outward man perishes, but our inward man is renewed day by day. It's going to come a time when we get an outward man that can keep up with our inward man and live forever with the life that's on the inside of us. Is this too deep for some of y'all? Because that's the living hope that we have. It's part of it. We have an expectation of an eternal life that's coming. This world, this life that we live is not the end. And we got to stop acting like it's the end. And we got to teach our children that it's not the end. We got some parents that never talk about themselves crossing over, never leaving a will, never saying, even though I'm gone, you're going to still have to serve God. You better prepare your seed for a day when you're not there. The worst thing a man could do is to leave his house unprepared for his departure. You got to let them all know that a day going to come when we go the way of all the earth. All right? But the same breath you tell them that one day mom and daddy going to go. You look at them with tears in your eyes. You say, but death is not the end. Ha! You are. You anybody hear me up in here? Because cause daddy might be leaving for a little trip. But daddy coming back with Jesus, daddy. Woo! Are you hearing me up in here? Why? We have an expectation of life. He said, but we all will be transformed. 52 says it will happen in a moment. In the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live. How long? Forever. And we who are living also will be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Our old enemy, death, will finally be swallowed up in victory. Hey! It says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, oh, oh death, where is that victory? Oh, grave, where is your sting? For the sting uh, that results in death and the law gives sins its power. For sin is the sting that results in death and gives the law its power. Uh, and, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death. Through who? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, I'm telling you, man. Hallelujah. That's amazing. He broke the cycle of death, Brother Carl. Physical debt is not our big problem no more because we're going to live forever. Eternal death is not even our problem no more because since we've made peace through Christ, we're not only going to live forever, but we're going to live forever with him, Sean White. Right? We're going to live forever with him. And so we, now we got, we got, hallelujah, we, we defeated debt on two ends. That physical debt, we're not worried about that. We're getting a new body. That eternal debt, we ain't worrying about that. We're going to have eternal life with Jesus Christ. Anybody hear me up in here? But let me give you one of the best parts about being a believer, about that living hope. That living hope is not just about heaven, no. And it's not just about getting a new body. The hope is just not about that, no. Just like there was uh, eternal death and physical death, there was also daily death. The Christian in Christ have something that I call daily hope. Anybody hear me up here? Daily hope. And it comes from being in Christos. It comes from being in Christ. We have a hope, y'all, that the world don't have. Huh? We have a hope that the world don't have. Now, this, this word hope in the Greek is elpis. It means an eager, confident expectation of that which is good. The, the King James says a lively hope. Other translations says a living hope. All right? And, and commentators say that this hope is actually alive in the believer. It's in you. It's in you. And when bad things happen, that thing want to tell you, it's going to be all right. God got you. God got you. And if you, if you allow it and not allow yourself to get in the pit, that thing going to let you know. It's going to let you know. Huh? It's going to let you know. Because Jesus didn't die for us 
to have eternal life and new bodies. He just didn't die for that. Look what he said in John 10.10. 10. He said, a thief come not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Jesus don't want to give you just heaven life. He want to give you life right now. All right? Life right now. He wants you to be blessed right now, joyful right now, peace right now, living full right now. And you see, sometimes we get in the King James, and I've been showing you all the translations because I need to get it in your mind. Because listen, you read the King James, you might not understand it all the time. Let me give it to you in another translation so you can understand it better. Hallelujah. Look what it says. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and they may have life to the full. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many people want a full life? How many people want a full life? He don't want nothing empty in your life. Nothing lacking in your life. Nothing short in your life. He wants you to live to the fullest. Amen. I think we have another translation in the NLT. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose, Jesus says, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Wow. Are you hearing what I'm talking about? You, That's what Jesus want to give you. That's what he want to do for you. You know? And the church done lost that. The church waiting for their sweet by and by apple pie in the sky. That's not what your pastor faith say. My, my, my faith say that every day God is working it out on my behalf. <laughs> In every situation. And he wants that for me. Listen, you know the scriptures. huh? Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil. To give you an expected end. You know what that sounds like in the other translations? Look what he says in the other translations. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and to give you what else? A hope. That's what it's all about, man. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Whatever you're going through tonight, whatever not working out in your life right now, Huh? Don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about a thing. Your God has got you. Don't expect the worst. Expect the best. Expect good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Expect good. And even if it's bad things that's happening, expect that the end of those things are going to be good. Anybody hear me up in here? Your tears right now of pain are going to be turned to tears of joy. If you just wait a while, if you just wait a while, you just wait a while. Pastor, how can you say that? I know my Bible. In Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for the good ha, to them that love God. Do you love God tonight? Yeah. Do you love God tonight? Huh? Can God lie? Huh? No, God can't lie. So if he say that all things, how many things? All things. What do they do? They work together. For what? For the good. To who? To them that love God. Do you love God? Yes. Then all these things, even the bad things, even the painful things, even the things that make you cry, even the way they betrayed you, stabbed you in the back, left you broken, busted, huh? Even those things, Joseph, going to work together for your good. Come on, give y'all some praise up in this place. I know people that have been through some things, yo. Some abuse. Some abandonment. Some people saying that they was never going to be anything. Never going to turn out to be right. It was cast aside. It was never the favorite. It was always rejected. When people would look for something good, they would be the last one that they would think something good would come from them. And I want to tell you that all those things, God allowed you to go through all those things. 
He allowed you to go through all those things because he's going to do something in your life that though they told you, you wouldn't believe it. Anybody hear me up in here? He allowed all that because your end is going to be greater than your beginning. Anybody hear me up in here? And when they look at your beginning and where you come from and where you're going to end up, they're going to have to give God the glory because there was no way you could get from here to there without the hand of God upon your life. I'm here to testify tonight. I'm here to testify tonight. All you got to do is keep believing. All you got to do is keep hoping and expecting that God going to work it out. You see? He going to work it out, y'all. I promise you, I promise you. I promise you. I've seen it with my own eyes. (laughs) An expectation of good. And so that's what Christ, he's done for us, y'all. The way it was was just death. The way it was was just heartache. The way it was was just, listen, we just, we just live to die. And every day, huh, we didn't expect anything good, but it was only could get worse. And then Christ came. <laughs> hey! And he threw a quick two-piece on sin and death. Huh? And he rescued us from his clutches. And Peter said, man, all praise to God. All praises, because he's given us a lively hope. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. Hallelujah. 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 If you're here tonight and you have not closed with Christ, meaning that you have not made him your personal Lord and Savior for yourself, I know that mama might be saved. I know that daddy might be saved. I know that people all around you might be saved, but you ain't did that thing for yourself. It's a personal thing. Can't nobody get saved for you. You see? Just like sin is personal and disobedience is personal, salvation got to be personal. You can't rely on mama to get you saved. Mama didn't sin for you. (laughs) Huh? You did that against God. You disobeyed God. So you have to get right with God for yourself. And how do you get right with God tonight? Through the cross of Calvary, through the blood of Jesus, you admit that you're a sinner, you believe in his death, his burial, his resurrection, you allow that blood to wash you, to clean you, to get you forgiven. And once you're forgiven, death will have no more power over you. Despair will have no more power over you. Depression will have no more power over you. Hopelessness will have no more power over you. Because you know that your God is able in the darkest times to turn everything around. Everything around. Everything around. And so tonight we're going to pray and we're going to pray that sinner's prayer and I'm going to believe. Let me look into this camera right here. I'm going to believe that somebody's going to really accept Christ tonight. That somebody really going to close with Christ. They was in a pit, y'all. Be praying, saints. Be praying. They was in a pit, y'all. They couldn't even find their way up. They was being choked and suffocated by the darkness, ready to take their life. But God spoke to them tonight. And they saw a north star of hope. That star wasn't me. That star was Jesus. That's who they saw. That's who they saw. That's who they saw. And I promise you, you close with Christ tonight. You get your life right with him. I'm not saying you ain't going to have no hard days, no tough days. But you're going to have hope in those tough days. And so let's pray. Pray with me now. Say, Most High God, thank you for a living hope. Thank you that you are able to turn any situation around. I admit, I've sinned against you. But your ability allowed you to send Christ to die for 
for all my sins. I believe in Christ. His life, his, his death, and his resurrection. Save me, Lord, by your power. And give me a living hope. No matter what happens, no matter how bad it gets, help me to trust you and always believe that you are able. In Jesus' name. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A living hope. A living hope. A living hope. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, a living hope. A living hope. And for us Hebrews in here, this is a special word for us. Because if he did it before for us, ha, he is able to do it again for us. <laughs> he is able to save us again, rescue us again, take us out of Egypt again. Don't you dare sit here, people of God, hopeless. But be hopeful. He's still a sea split God. He's still a wilderness, bread raining from heaven type of God. He's a God that can take us. Though now we ought to tell, he can make us the head. And he is able to do it in one night, <laughs> one hour, one second. Why, why, why? He is able. Come on, give him some praise in his house. Hallelujah. 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 He is able. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bless you. You get no? And bless you. Bless you with shalom peace. Shalom, Israel. Shalom, Israel. Love y'all. Love y'all. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Appreciate you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Let me turn this off, man. Thank you.